Oh, Johnny. How we miss you. Been dead almost a hundred years. Hey folks, welcome back to Bullet Points. Today we have the Winchester 1892. Yes, if you've been following this, we have skipped several different repeating rifles that Winchester produced. There's a reason. These things are not cheap, and not everybody has them, so I couldn't get any loaners for the ones that I was looking for. Uh, but the 92, this was my first Winchester rifle that I've ever received. I did not buy this gun. This was, uh, this was given to me by my great uncle, who actually bought it off of a Burbank movie set when they started to uh, get rid of stuff that they didn't need anymore. So he paid not a whole lot of money, put a significant amount of work into it to get it up and running again. And then he used this for his cowboy action shooting career for, uh, for as long as he played that game. Uh, he was never a professional, always amateur stuff, but always fun stuff. Uh, and his gun collection has always made me drool a bit. When it comes to original stuff, uh, this is the most original piece that I have. We just did a serial number lookup on it, and it was a it came off Winchester's manufacturing floor in 1910. So that that's just cool. And this thing still functions, still fires. Uh, there is going to be a little bit at the end of this where I am shooting this rifle. Uh, I've had to do very very little repair to this gun over the years that I've had it. Recently, when we were actually shooting it uh, for this video, I had to have the hammer spring put back into the correct position because it had worn and uh, lost some of its juice. So it got a little sensitive about the type of primers it would actually fire. But with my good friends over at Central Iron Impact, 10 minutes in the shop and they had this thing up and going again. So that, that tells you how, how amazing the technology was back then and it continues to be. What is so exciting to me about this rifle is this is really the third rifle that John Moses Browning had a major hand in, in designing for Winchester. The entire action, this is a John Browning action. Knowing that it came off the assembly line in 1910 means that he specifically designed this. This was one of his um, really probably one of the second iterations that ever came off the line. And as a carbine, it addressed a couple of issues that they had with the 1873. The 1873 was always a little barrel heavy. Uh, even if you got the round barrel on it, it was just a, a piece of iron. Everybody could own it. It was a great rifle. It still is a great rifle. Uh, but the 92 really got thinned out. The steel got better. The, the amount of pressure that this thing could handle got crazy. Uh, so you could take this rifle, and this one was originally chambered in 4440 Winchester. It's been reboard out to uh, receive a, a uh, 45 Colt. Uh, that was something that my uncle did with it. Fires beautifully. I mean, there is no recoil to this gun. This is actually the gun that my kids used to deer hunt their first or second season as they're learning to take recoil and make good shots. Um, so what was so what was so changing about this rifle compared to the 73? One of the things that Winchester kind of struggled with was when it came to large, large animal hunting, large game hunting of any kind, so you're talking buffalo, uh, big bears, elk, moose, there wasn't really a repeating rifle out there that could handle that size of an animal. Uh, they needed something that was shooting a 4570 or one of the larger calibers, um, even like the 5110. Those were some significant recoiling big game cartridges. And there was no lever action uh, mechanism that could handle that kind of pressure. 
they had to be a breech loader. And those breech loaders, <coughs> they were they were good, they were accurate, but they were slow. Even the 1885 falling block, John Browning's first patent that he sold to Winchester, uh, was faster than the than the trap door Springfields and things like that, but it wasn't it wasn't really quick. So when when John Browning goes to Winchester and sells him on the idea of his 1885 falling block, from the word go, you have uh, Oliver Winchester talking with him and saying, hey, you know, I'd really like to see what you could do to make a repeating arm that can handle these cartridges. So Browning comes back with the 1886. The 1886 lever action design created this action. And if you can see, there's two lugs right here that come up and they brace against the bolt. This bolt was also the first fully enclosed bolt. There's no dust cover on this. There didn't have to be. And again, just like we've seen with all of our other Winchesters uh, and our Henry, it's taken another step to close all of this up to where you don't have to worry about dirt, gravel, dust, everything else getting in there. But those two lugs were the big deal. You can see them down here connected to the lever. So they drop as you drop the lever and they come back up and fit into these two grooves. The amount of strength that that provided to the action was so great that in the 1886, all of a sudden they could chamber a lever action for a 4570, or the 5110, or the 4085. All of these big, large, big game, powerful cartridges could now be fired out of a repeating rifle. And that was John Browning's huge, huge advancement on our lever action rifle. John Browning went on for years uh, and totally changed the world of firearms. Uh, in my opinion, he might not have been the father of firearms, but he was the most significant impact on the firearm industry before or since. And there's, there's no one that's done more for uh, whether it's automatic firearms, semi-automatic firearms, shotguns, lever action rifles. That guy did it all uh, from his little shop in Ogden, Utah standing next to his brothers, which is also cool. He had four brothers, that, or three brothers that worked with him. And it was the, started out as John Browning and Brothers. The second one was just Browning Firearms Company. Browning is still out there today, uh, producing amazingly high quality stuff that's very reliable. And that was what John was always about, was how do I make it better? How do I make it more reliable? Uh, not how do I make it more complicated? If you notice, I've, I've taken this rifle completely apart uh, to clean all of the insides out and everything else. It's a nerve wracking process to do because there are some small pieces, but I don't know anything about engineering. But with a couple of schematics, I was able to take this, up, take this apart, disassemble every piece, clean every piece, and put it all back in. And this thing still fires. Anybody could work on it. That was the beauty of the John Browning designs. This is also amazingly light. On average, this was probably two to three pounds lighter than the Winchester 73 uh, in any of its variants. This is a carbine model. It's also called a saddle ring carbine. If you like the old Westerns, you know all about that saddle ring. Uh, if you don't know about the old Westerns, why was that important? Well, cowboys had these on their horses, and they're riding through brush, they're trying to chase cows. Uh, anybody that's worked cows before knows that they like to go to nasty, thick places when they go to bed. And if you're riding through that brush, your rifle is sitting in its, in its sheath underneath your leg on the saddle, and if you run into brush, it can pull it out. Well, the saddle ring, was just a little addition that he put on it 
to where you could put a tether between here and your scabbard. Long enough that you can still pull it out and use it off a of horseback or untie it if you're going to go out and hunt game, whether you're shooting dinner or um, having to defend your cows. It's these simple, effective um, upgrades that John Browning brought to the whole rifle game. Despite popular belief, John Browning was never was never employed by Winchester. He was a partner with Winchester. John's shop was not capable of producing the numbers of his designs that he wanted to. So when he first started with Winchester, he would sell them the patent. He'd design the rifle, action, whatever piece that they wanted, and then he'd sell it to them for an upfront price. Uh, later on in his career, after he'd had many, many successful uh, designs that went on, he would try to renegotiate with Winchester and say, hey, for this one, instead of taking my standard flat upfront fee, I'm going to sell it to you for a smaller percentage, but I want a percentage of royalties as far as that rifle or shotgun goes. Uh, the shotgun that was in question at the time was the Browning A5, uh, which we all, anybody in the gun world knows that the A5 really changed what American sportsmen can use for a semi-automatic shotgun. We won't go too much into that, but that was the parting point between John Browning and Oliver Winchester. This 92 action is so smooth, so strong, so special, and it is an honor to own this rifle. So if my uncle sees this, it's still working, Bob, and it still does a good job. Guys, thank you again for stopping by and checking out bullet points. Please like and subscribe to the channel, Ammo and Oils. Uh, We've got some other great stuff coming. Next week, we're going to do the Savage 99. And that was a highly interesting rifle. And the guy who designed it has an even cooler story. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.